At the end of the Second World War, Germany was in ruins. The Führer Adolf Hitler lay dead, killed by his own hand in a Berlin bunker. When Hitler came to power, he had promised his people a brave new world and a bright new future. Instead, he murdered their sick relatives in hospital cellars and brutally castrated thousands of their children. He persecuted gypsies, homosexuals and the disabled. He oversaw a campaign of industrialized slaughter which killed over six million Jews. And to the world he brought a war of unparalleled destruction. A war that would claim more than 40 million lives over half of them civilians. In 1914, patriotic crowds gathered in German streets to celebrate the outbreak of World War I. Amongst them, was the 25-year-old Hitler. He was a failed artist scraping an existence in a Munich Doss house. He joined the German army hoping to turn his frustration with life into action. In the nightmare of the trenches, Hitler found a world which matched the darkness of his own mind. While most soldiers dreamed of their families and homes, the young Hitler dreamed of only one thing, war. The First World War brutalized him, deadened his feelings, made him see everything in propaganda terms as you know, a clash of good and evil, black and white. When the war ended in disaster for Germany, Hitler was an angry man. He ranted to anyone who would listen that Germany had been betrayed by a conspiracy headed by Jews. If he had been in charge, he would have known exactly what to do. Back in Munich, Hitler was recruited by the German army to spy on a small extremist group called the National Socialist Workers' Party. The group was nationalistic, anti-Semitic and violent. Hitler liked what he saw and offered his services as a speaker. Here was somebody who was aggressively asserting German interests and German values. The Germans are being told, in addition to being you know, the most hard-working made in Germany, um, most civilized people in Europe, they're being told also, yes, and you're, there's a bit of the sort of barbaric Hun down there somewhere in you, and if all these other countries, their corrupt statesmen or whatever, if they don't watch out, we're going to unleash this barbarian all over the place. And I think actually some people rather like to be told that. Hitler's bloodthirsty speeches struck a chord. Party attendance first doubled, then trebled. In a short time, Hitler was able to bully his way into becoming the undisputed leader of the Nazi party. In the beer halls of Munich, Hitler recruited an army of thugs called the Sturmabteilung, or SA. Their purpose was to spread terror, intimidation and violence onto the city streets. At meetings, they would act as his bodyguard, mercilessly beating up anyone who questioned the words of the Führer. While his brutish gangs ruled the streets, Hitler embarked on a campaign to charm respectable society. He could play at lots of levels. In other words, there was a type of um, folksy earnestness which appealed to the lower classes. You know, this was a man who'd shake your hand firmly and tell you that he'd worked on the building site, whereas, of course, one look at him, you could tell that he hadn't. On the other hand, he moved very easily in society draw drawing rooms where it's quite obvious that uh, society ladies thought of him as a bit of attractive rough that he had a sort of bohemian chic about him. Hitler encouraged his female supporters by presenting himself as a hermit-like, celibate figure who devoted all his energies to the good of Germany. But again, the image he projected was a lie. 
He was at the time involved with a number of teenage mistresses, beginning with Maria Reiter, the daughter of an innkeeper from Berchtesgaden. He was 37, she was 16, so she was literally young enough to be his daughter. And he felt much more at home when he could be patronizing, could be superior, could be avuncular, could be the older man. The mistress that made the biggest impression on Hitler was 16-year-old Geli Raubel. She was Hitler's niece, the daughter of his half-sister, Angela. In 1929, Geli moved into Uncle Alf's grand apartment on Munich's Prinz Regentenplatz. She took a bedroom adjoining his on the second floor. Geli was vivacious, idealistic and free-spirited. Hitler was controlling, strict and possessive. Geli felt trapped, but Hitler would not let her go. The longer they were involved, the more she saw of the seamy side. There was obviously uh, a nasty side to his sexual nature, just as there was a very nasty side to his political nature. On the 19th of September 1931, Geli was found dead in Hitler's flat. She was bleeding from a wound near her heart. One arm was stretched out towards a pistol, a Walther 6.35. The police recorded a verdict of suicide. Geli was the first mistress to be driven to a violent death by Hitler, but she would not be the last. The actress, Renata Muller, threw herself to her death from a window in 1937, and Ava Brown attempted suicide at least once before her final pact with Hitler. But it was Geli's picture that Hitler kept in his bedroom in Munich and Berlin until his death in 1945. In 1932, the global depression hit Germany hard. When it came to the elections, the Germans needed a radical solution. The solution they chose was Hitler and the Nazi party. Germany is in a state of absolute chaos and along out of nowhere comes this unknown soldier figure, the Messiah, whose role it is is to lead the German people into a type of paradise on earth. And you don't have to wait until the afterlife, this is in the here and now. But Hitler's new German paradise was not a place where everyone was welcome. They are treacherous, cowardly and cruel, and appear in large swarms. In the animal kingdom, they represent the element of underground destruction. In fact, they are just like the Jews. From the very beginning, Hitler's propaganda had portrayed the Jewish people as the source of everything that was wrong in German society. When Hitler came to power, he banned marriage and sexual intercourse between Germans and Jews. And he reintroduced a medieval law forcing Jews to wear a yellow star of identification. In November 1938, Hitler whipped up anti-Semitic feeling into a nationwide frenzy of violence. Jewish shop windows were broken, over a hundred Jews were killed and 27,000 were interned in camps for their so-called protection. It was called the Reichskristallnacht, the Imperial Night of Crystal. In the morning at school, we knew that the local synagogue was burning. And as a young boy, you're curious and you want to see. So we sped off on our bikes about 10 kilometers. By the time we got there, the synagogue had pretty much burned down. The fire brigade was standing there watching, but they weren't putting out the fire. At the same time that Hitler was inciting violence against Jews, he was also conducting a campaign to brainwash the German children he considered racially pure. These were to be the seeds from which he would grow a master race. Reiner, Deutsch 
My German youth, we expect you German boys and German girls to embody everything that we hope for in Germany. We want to be one nation, and you, my German youth, shall become this nation. I was six or seven years old and was lucky enough to meet Hitler. I gave him flowers and he patted me on the head. I must admit, as a small boy, I was blown away by the man. It was like a religious experience. At one point he makes a very crucial speech where he says, we're going to take a child of six or eight and put them into the junior branch of the Hitler Youth, then they will go into the SS, the army or whatever, and we will keep them, we will have captured them for the rest of their lives. Main Führer. My Führer, I think of you and love you like father and mother. I will always obey you like father and mother. And when I grow up, I'll help you like father and mother. And you'll be proud of me like father and mother. With complete control of the German political system, its army and its youth, Hitler was ready to take increasingly extreme steps towards his vision of the new Germany. But to do this, he would need a war. When Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, he was embarking on a world war which would cost the lives of more than 40 million people. In Germany, he was already waging another war, a war against the German people themselves. We will care for them, but we will not allow them to reproduce. These unfortunate creatures should not be allowed to live alongside our healthy children. Sterilization is just a simple medical procedure. Hitler was a hypochondriac and he had never been good at sport. Yet he believed that the sick and weak were an unnecessary burden on the rest of society. In 1933 he ordered the brutal sterilization of 400,000 gypsies, disabled and long-term unemployed, people that he considered genetically substandard. When the war began, Hitler's genetic campaign took a murderous turn. He signed this document, ordering the clandestine murder of long-term patients in German hospitals and institutions. The nurse asked me once if I fancied carrying some dirty washing to the laundry. I said, why not? I was pleased to get out of doors for a bit. I noticed that the baskets were heavier than usual, so when they weren't looking I had a peek under the laundry and in each of them were the bodies of three children, two boys and one girl, and on another day it was the other way round. At first the systematic killing was carried out by lethal injection. But as Hitler's list of murder candidates grew, a new technique for mass murder was developed. It was tested in six provincial hospitals, including Hadamar Asylum in Hessen. Here, the patients were taken into the basement where they were asked to undress. They were then directed to the shower room. But the drain in the floor was a fake. and the pipes didn't contain water, but carbon monoxide gas. The death notice arrived. There was a death certificate and a letter which said that the corpse of my mother could not be sent due to the danger of infection. It had to be cremated straight away. 
Hitler's hospitals of death claimed over 300,000 lives. The bodies were never released to the relatives in case they uncovered the truth. While Hitler's troops laid waste to Europe, a million-strong army of slave laborers from Poland, France and Yugoslavia were toiling to build huge monuments to Hitler's vanity. Germany was changing beyond all recognition. It would have been a trans-European empire reaching into the Urals uh, with various so-called tribesmen um, beyond the frontier who would get zapped and then led in defeat in the Roman-style triumphs through Germania as the capital Berlin would have been renamed by 1955. As Hitler's megalomania grew, he began to see himself as something more than human. He believed he was an agent of divine will, like the emperors of ancient Rome. When he ordered the building of a gigantic Nazi meeting hall, it was based on the Roman Colosseum. Only Hitler's Colosseum was to be twice as high and seat over 50,000 people. This was what Hitler's thousand-year Reich was to look like. If the international Jewish finance crew succeeds in plunging the peoples of the world into another world war, the result will not be the Bolshevization of the planet and the victory of the Jews. The result will be the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. At the outbreak of the war, Hitler had interned all German Jews in camps. In occupied territories such as Poland, they were corralled in inner city areas called ghettos. Here, they were to be worked to death, manufacturing material to help the German war effort. We were herded into the barbed wire enclosure, the lodge ghetto. Death soon claimed many of my friends of my family, because it's difficult now to impart how miserable that life was. Constant hunger, cold, dirt, no matter how hard you tried. There were no means really, but we tried very hard to, to keep some semblance of human dignity. When the Americans entered the war in 1941 and Russian resistance stiffened, Hitler had to confront the possibility of defeat for the first time. It was at this point that he decided to annihilate the entire Jewish population of Nazi-occupied Europe. For the task of killing enormous Jewish population, they clearly needed some method which was, could be done on a huge scale and wasn't psychologically upsetting for the people doing the killing. What they did essentially was to generalize the method used in the euthanasia program, except using large, almost industrial-sized gas chambers. At the beginning of 1941, the transportation began of all Jews within the Reich to the newly built death camps in the east. They were to be gassed and their bodies were to be burned in crematoria. The largest of these factories of death was Auschwitz. When we said, where are we? And he said, what do you mean? You don't know? No. This is Auschwitz. What is Auschwitz? They were angry. I mean, these were mainly also Jewish or Pol people who were working at the, uh, at the railways when we were arriving. This is a death camp. You have arrived, but we don't think that you will leave this place. Over a million men, women and children died in Auschwitz. Their shaven hair was kept for stuffing German furniture and the dust of their bones was collected as fertilizer for the farms of Hitler's Reich. I was there with my mother. 
And while we were moving and moving and moving, people were saying to the youngsters like me, say you are 18 or 19, don't say you are younger, say you are 18 or 19. When it came to my mother, she just told the truth and didn't realize we are 44, 45. I was told to go to one side and I wanted to run after her and I was asked how old I was and I said 19 and I was put to the other side and this is the last I, I saw of my mother. In 1942, the 270,000 men of Hitler's 6th Army were trapped by the Red Army at Stalingrad. Hitler refused to allow them to retreat. As they stared annihilation in the face, he ordered them to die like heroes. When the 90,000 survivors surrendered, Hitler went berserk. But the tide had turned. He was losing the war. I had a little room with a big map of Russia with flags in. I noticed that after the Battle of Stalingrad, the flag started moving backwards. Soon it was clear that the war was coming to Germany, and we wondered, what will happen then? As Russian tanks crashed across the German borders and headed towards Berlin, Hitler carried out yet another act of betrayal. Hitler had decided that um, being an um, extreme social Darwinist, that uh, the German people had shown that they were not fit for the fight against what had proved to be the stronger people to the east. And um, he thought, well, they've, they haven't won it. They've shown themselves almost biologically deficient, so they must be useless. So therefore, I don't care whether we blow the whole place to pieces. Um, he orders the complete destruction of the whole infrastructure of Germany. Hitler's Nero order was never carried out. The Germans had finally had enough. Hitler appeared one last time before the cameras. He was a physical wreck, smiling inanely as he touched the faces of boy soldiers about whose imminent death he cared nothing. On the 28th of April 1945, Hitler married Eva Braun, and on the following afternoon he poisoned and shot himself to avoid capture. In his final will and testament, Hitler declared his love for the country he had destroyed and warned future German leaders to observe the laws of race and mercilessly oppose that universal poisoner of all peoples, the Jews.